Good morning to everybody. A warm welcome on this uh, fresh autumn morning. This morning, I'm going to talk to you about wheel alignment, um, and I'm going to go through some of the principles of wheel alignment, and the area I'm going to spend the most of time on is on ride height, but we'll get to that as, uh, as we progress through. So let's uh, keep our seats on and go through the process. Wheel alignment takes in five different sectors, that being toe, um, where we refer to toe in or toe out, a caster, which is a positive or negative caster, camber, which is also a negative or positive uh, discussion around uh, whether the camber is positive or negative. Thrust angle is very much an angle, which we'll talk about, and then ride height, as I mentioned shortly, uh, a short while ago. Talking about uh, toe and toe in, toe out, positive toe or toe in is the front of the wheel pointing towards the center line of the vehicle. Negative toe out or toe, negative toe or toe out is the front of the wheel pointing away from the center line of the vehicle. And it's usually measured in angular, in, in degrees and, and seconds of an angle. If we look at the picture on the right hand side of the uh, sketch of the Formula One car, there's a gray line that runs right through through the center. And, um, and, and that's basically down there where I'm drawing now in the red. And that gives you your, your perpendicular or dead straight line through the vehicle. That's also your thrust angle line. But if we look at the toe on the, on, on the, at the top, the green shows toe out where the wheels are pointing outwards and the red where the wheels are, would be pointing inwards at the front or at the rear and you can have toe adjustments at front or rear um, depending on on the uh, on the particular vehicle and um, it's it's pretty critical to to how the vehicle tracks and how the vehicle uh, maintains uh, con you maintain control steering control over the vehicle now, before I continue, let me just bring in a point that, uh, that I didn't want to get into too much detail around. But at this point in time, most people regard the front axle as where the steering of the vehicle is, uh, is, is managed from. So everybody accepts that that's where you steer the vehicle from. Quite correct. That's where you change the steering angle or direction of the vehicle from. However, the actual steering of the vehicle comes from the rear wheels. The rear wheels are what control where the car goes because of they, they don't change direction. It sounds a bit crazy, but the vehicle is actually steered from the rear wheels. The steering control comes from the rear wheels. The steering direction is changed with the front wheels. So just bear that in mind because I did mention once before in one of the earlier uh, sessions that when putting on new, new tires onto a vehicle, one should always put the best tires at the rear and not at the front because steering comes from the rear. So for what that's worth, let's just move on to the next slide and we'll talk, about, talk in more detail about alignment. Let me just clear the uh, drawings, there we go. So the alignment of the wheels of the car can change the handling of the vehicle. Toe in alignment of the vehicles can help reduce steer, oversteer problems and can increase stability in vehicles that have front wheel drives. So if you've got slight toe in on a front wheel drive, it's preferable because as the vehicle accelerates, it lifts up on the front and the wheels will pull outwards. So you, your slight toe in alignment then becomes square and becomes a zero to alignment in alignment under, under acceleration and movement. Alternately, with a rear wheel drive, toe out alignment helps to mitigate the issues under, related to understeering, and it improves the handling of the vehicle that has rear wheel drive. Because of the push from the rear, it adjusts the suspension under acceleration and under, under motion. These are all the factors that are taken into consideration by the engineers when they design the vehicle and they set up the specifications for the vehicle. So it's, it's not something that, uh, that you need to worry about so long as it's the alignment is being, the toe alignment is being set by a professional who's trained and using preferably a 3D 
wheel alignment system. The actual amount of toe of angle that the toe is adjusted for each wheel is incredibly small. Um, it goes down into fractions of a degree or seconds of, of, a, of a minute of a degree. Um, and, and it needs to be pretty close to, to accurate. Otherwise, uh, you will run the risk of shredding tires and being out, having a more difficult vehicle to control and drive. Regular wheel alignment should be part of normal automotive maintenance. And again, I'll say it again at a later hour, the requirement should be for regular balancing, rotation, and alignment of your vehicle's wheels. And that regular being approximately 8,000 kilometers. By doing regular rotation, balancing, and alignment, you can, you can and I stress you can, save up to 25% of the life of a tire. There are many reasons why wheel alignment might move out of alignment. You could hit in on our wonderful roads potholes. You could bump up against a curbstone. I know many of us driving buckies believe that we are bulletproof and can climb up and down curbstones for to find parking. Harsh roads, in other words, traveling on dirt roads that are, have corrugations, uh, creates accelerated wear of suspension components and it also forces uh, undue stresses onto the vehicle body and, and chassis rails, which can lead to alignment issues. And of course, accident damage and then wear and tear. Uh, wear and tear being on your control arm bushes, your, your tie rod ends, your ball joints and so on, as they wear, so they allow for uh, toe alignment to, to, to adjust or to go out of alignment. Improper toe angles can obviously make the steering less responsive. Um, if you've got too much toe in or too much toe out, you're going to be fighting with your steering wheel more than you need to to keep, uh, keep it in the direction that you want to go. Improper alignment can also cause a significant amount of wear on the tires and will dramatically reduce the lifespan. Now, as I said, if you've got toe out, too much toe out, the inner edge of your tires are going to get shredded on the road and you'll have a, a dramatic reduction in the lifespan. Too much toe in and the outer edge of your tires are going to get worn out as they're pushing to try and keep straight. So again, these the toe is an, is a, an adjustment or measurement specification that is set by the engineers when they design the vehicle, given the movement and flex of the suspension. Uh, during acceleration or deceleration, um, obviously acceleration and and forward movement being um, being the more common uh, reason for changing alignment. Alignment into a toe, as I said earlier, should only be performed by a trained professional using an up-to-date 3D alignment machine. Up-to-date meaning that the specifications in the alignment machine must be the latest. There are occasions when a uh, and a manufacturer changes the specifications for a good reason. Um, the engineers have just have found that the original specifications are not are no longer ideal, and they will put out an update to those uh, to those specifications. Therefore, it's important that you that you use uh, that you make sure that the person using the equipment is trained and that the the latest specifications have been loaded onto that three D alignment machine. Talking about wheel alignment, I mentioned caster earlier. Positive caster, neutral caster, negative caster. Now, what we typically do is we will put onto a vehicle, uh, and, and in South Africa, what we would do is we would have a slightly positive caster on the left of the vehicle and a potentially either neutral or slightly negative camber caster on the on the right hand side front wheel. The reason for this is so that the vehicle is countering the camber of the road in order to keep it straight. If you had purely neutral camber, the vehicle would typically want to veer off to the left because the roads are cambered slightly to the left. They are cambered to the left to afford drainage on the roads. And you would end up saying that your vehicle's not going straight, you let the steering wheel go and the vehicle starts pulling off to the left of the road and you'll be going back and forth. So we push slightly, very slightly, because 
does, believe it or not, you still want the vehicle to go slightly to the left if the steering wheel is left alone. And that is a collision avoidance uh, measurement uh, or counter measurement. So that if you, if you happen to, to let the wheel go and the, the, uh, the, you don't want the vehicle veering off to the right-hand side into the head-on traffic. You'd rather go off slightly to the left um, for, from a, let's call it a, a safety perspective. So neutral caster is when the vehicle, when the front wheel is absolutely perpendicular to the, to the, uh, to the top of the mounting of the shock absorber. Positive caster is when the, uh, the wheel is slightly forward of the, uh, the top of the top mounting of the of the front shock or, or MacPherson strut and negative caster going backwards. And it stands to reason how that would affect the, uh, the, the, the direction of, directional stability of the car. So caster makes the vehicle stable and predictable. The caster angle is the slope of the steering axis. Steering axis is the imaginary line that intersects the upper and lower ball joints. Cast angle can be positive or negative. It is expressed in degrees. When the bottom of the steering axis is in front of the tire's contact patch, it is called positive caster. And when the ball joint is behind the upper one, the tire and wheel contact patch will contact the road behind the steering axis, resulting in negative caster. And then finally, when the steering axis is at zero degrees, i.e. perpendicular or vertical, then it is called zero caster. Positive, caster and negative, uh, positive and negative caster can influence the performance of your vehicle. Positive caster provides straight line stability at speed. The positive caster creates a tension that wants to keep the front wheel straight while you're driving at speed. It keeps the vehicles traveling in a straight line and it also helps to keep, return the tire to an upright position when coming out of a turn. Now you may remember when I spoke about shock absorbers a few weeks ago, I mentioned that there are car park tests that can be done, which would be to determine whether the top mount of the shock absorber is in good condition or not. Now, similarly, if the caster is in the wrong position, when you do a full lock turn and you release the steering wheel, if it's not uh, in the right position, it won't. The steering won't correct back to to uh, straight ahead very quickly, or in fact, at all. And that leads to, to steering issues going forward. Positive caster angles can be anything between three to five degrees on modern vehicles. And that's because of the levels of acceleration, the reduced uh, uh, unsprung mass weights that are, are uh, being continuously worked on from an engineering and design perspective. And where there's no power steering, a three to four degree caster setting reduces the weight of the steering. It makes it lighter to be able to steer the car. If it's a zero caster or a negative caster, the steering becomes very heavy to, main, to, to try and uh, work with. And, um, and, and just going into a positive caster situation makes it a lot lighter and, and easier to turn. And obviously the, the camber and toe We'll talk about camber and toad. Uh, we've spoken about toad. We'll talk about camber just now, which can save you money uh, on your tires. So let's move on to camber as we go. Camber under wheel alignment, positive camber, negative camber. Camber angle is the angle of the wheels or camber angle is the slope of the imaginary line that runs vertically through the center of the tire tread. At zero degree, this imaginary line will be perpendicular to the road. So when your tire is, when you've got your wheel off the, off the vehicle and it's standing up on its own, that's at a zero camber angle, um, providing it's not too badly worn. But yes, if it's standing up vertical, then it's at zero, zero camber. If you put in, go into a positive camber, you are, are um, pushing the top of the tires out, outwards from the wheel arch and the bottom inwards. And you see, if we look at the uh, at, at where I'm marking now, you can see the bulge on the outside of the tire where the pressure is. And obviously you're gonna have, have wear on that section before you have wear on the, on the other side. And similarly in negative camber, you would have wear on that corner or that side of the tire as opposed to the other. Now in motor racing, you'll see the, the, the cars, the race cars are set with major negative camber. And that's because when they are cornering at such high speeds and under 
uh, uh, such stresses, when the vehicle rolls in the, into the corner, and when I obviously I spoke last time about shock absorbers with the with the body roll, as the body rolls into the corner, no matter how stiff the suspension, there is a bit of roll. It brings the vehicle, the 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 opposite corner tire up almost to vertical and keeps the contact surface or contact tread patch um, where it needs to be to create the adhesion to the road. So negative camber is is uh, is is a ra pretty much a, a racing benefit. Um, negative camber occurs when the top of the vehicle's tire tucks inwards to have a good balance for cornering grip and braking grip a slight amount of negative camber, um, 0 0.5 to 1 degree is best. That's on a normal road going car. I mean, I've, I personally have uh, been required at times to set up race cars with 3 and 4 degrees of negative camber, which uh, if you had to drive on the road with that, you wouldn't drive for very long and your tires would be shredded. It helps to improve ha handling by keeping the tire perpendicular to the road, as I mentioned, when you're under cornering. During hard cornering or load condition, the negative camber stabilizes the tire contact patch. Um, it only benefits cornering traction and performance of the tire, but also improves the longevity when used for performance driving. Obviously, that's uh, you know in the racing context. So a positive camber, when you tilt the positive camber, it's it changes the steering uh, management and steering inputs quite dramatically. In case you're draw, driving on uneven roads, your vehicle needs stability, which is provided by the positive camber. Um, typically, if you look at a tractor, um, many of most of us would have seen tractors, and you see that the the front tires of the tractor are are, are in a positive camber situation, and that's because of steering stability on the rough uh, roads or the rough terrain that the tractor operates on. Um, it's a very uncommon type of setting to set to set up on a on a road going vehicle, um, and and highly unlikely to to be of any benefit on a road, but it has from time to time been been used uh, on the on the roads, uh, um, depending on the situation. Talking about thrust angle, wheel alignment, thrust angle. That's the direct line between the two axles. So. What they do is they we talk about the 90 degree angle from the rear axle. So if you had a 90 degree angle line coming off the rear axle going forward, that would be your, your thrust angle. So thrust is, is derived from the rear axle initially, and it's the straight line going forward. What you want that straight the, the straight line to do, the straight line needs to intersect with the center of the front axle so that the the thrust of the vehicle is in a straight line and not offset like the picture shows i mean how many times do we see um buses and trucks in particular going down the road with a where they we refer to it as crabbing down the road running down the road like a crab so the thrust angle is a measurement involving the front and rear axles and the wheelbase of the four wheels and tires. In a standard automobile, the front and rear axles of the vehicle are parallel and a perpendicular line drawn straight forward from the center of the rear axle should intersect that same center position on the front axle. So if you don't have, have a straight thrust angle, you're, you, you're essentially having the front axle fighting against the rear axle. And so if you're in a rear wheel drive, a bucky for instance, your rear, your drive is pushing harder than it needs to against the front axle, um, and you are obviously using fuel, and you're not uh, you're not it's not a, a nice vehicle to try and drive and control. So it's a it's a very important part of of how we operate a vehicle, um, keeping the the wheels in a straight line. So looking further, it's therefore an angle degree measurement of the angle of off of this imaginary center line. So whichever way that line, which, whichever way you've gone, either left or right, is not ideal. 
you want it to be in a straight line, straight down the center of the vehicle so that the vehicle doesn't fought, force against itself and it doesn't, uh, you don't shred tires, you don't waste um, fuel money, etc., on the vehicle. And predominantly, if you look at the, the center picture with the solid axle, what often happens here is the, the locating pins on the leaf springs of a, of a rear wheel drive solid axle bucket. The, the locating pins, um, or, or um, they, they either wear out or they break off or they are forgotten in the replacement um, at the time of, of refitting the rear axle or the, the rear uh, leaf springs. And that means that the axle doesn't line straight up in the vehicle. So in this case, your front axle on, the, on this particular drawing here, the front axle is actually perpendicular and square to the vehicle, but your rear axle is not. But that doesn't affect the, quest, the point that your thrust angle is off center and you're going to be, be having a, an accelerated or an increased fuel consumption and tire wear. So thrust angle is also referenced the wheelbase of the vehicle and confirmation that both vehicles are angled within specification straight ahead with little variation. A vehicle with incorrect thrust angle will the, the ability to drive it and control it will be changed. It'll be more difficult. Your steering will be skew. You'll be fighting the vehicle. And when you turn left or right, the vehicle will handle differently and the steering will feel different in a left or a right turn. So that's in your immediate um, indication as a driver is when you turn left or right and the vehicle feels different depending on, on which direction you turn. Then that's when you, you need to start realizing that you've got a, a potential thrust angle issue in the vehicle. And more commonly, vehicles that have four-wheel alignment, the adjustment is caused by incorrect toe settings. Now, we often say a 3D four-wheel alignment system and rear wheel, the toe adjustment is done on the front. That's fine. But where there are toe adjustments on the rear, they need to be checked and tested as well because otherwise you will end up with a thrust angle uh, out of alignment. And again, toe settings can become altered over time with potholes or curb climbing, etc., or corrugated roads. So rear adjustment of toe is also important in vehicles where a rear toe adjustment is available. And we, we again, we recommend re frequent uh, alignment checks on, on the vehicle. And thrust angle diagnosis is a repair job left to the pros, meaning it's best to be done on a, on a 3D alignment machine that measures all the angles across the suspension of the vehicle. And I'm gonna talk about a proper alignment system uh, check in a few moments. Um, so incorrect, in the case of incorrect toe, toe adjustments, they need to be set. Basic challenges, changes to alignment factors like cast and camber are not uh, DIY, uh, not really DIY projects. Um, because of the need for the 3D system to measure the thrust angle and the, uh, and, and the rear toe as well at the same time. So now I said I was going to talk about ride height and um, need to do so fairly quickly as well. Obviously, ride height is the height of the vehicle above the road. The top picture of the, of the, uh, of the BMW with a lowered suspension done for handling reduces the roll, reduces the braking dive, and, um, and reduces the uh, acceleration squat. Um, obviously the vehicle below that, the, uh, the SUV clearly with raised suspension to make space for those 33 or 35 inch tires that are on that vehicle. Um, and, and it changes the characteristics of the vehicle completely. It changes the braking, it changes the, the cornering, it changes the, um, the acceleration as well. When we talk about the braking, obviously in the in the vehicle on the on the, the SUV down below, this height here 
being the ride height above. When you brake, the vehicle will nosedive onto that. And obviously because of the height aspect that's been adjusted, there'll be far more stresses onto the brakes on the front of this vehicle during braking. Um, and one cannot expect to have the same type of braking response as if this vehicle was at its correct ride height. So in many instances, an increased ride height normally should come a lot, be as, uh, uh, attributed with a, an improved or increased brake um, brake system as well to compensate for that load transfer under braking. Vehicle ride height, we talk about vehicle attitude. It, it's a physical attitude that's not what it should be. In other words, it's hanging from on left or right. It's nose down. We often see the older Nissan Buckies used to have a serious nose down and uh, there were the jokes that uh, the driver was obviously saving fuel because he was driving downhill all the time. Um, it's usually detected through through that. Um, ride out are not is not always an obvious measurement or an obvious issue, and it can't necessarily always be seen with the naked eye. It needs to be measured and checked against specifications of the vehicle. And a quick check is to take a tape measure between the fender and the top of the tire left to right, um, just to see if you have a have the vehicle level. Um, and that's a, a, a good good starter indication. Ride out is important because ride out determines where the control arms operate within their normal range. And obviously all suspension components are required to stretch and move. Um, as the vehicle goes over bumps or up and down, uh, whatever curbs, and um, if it, if the ride height is wrong, then the the vehicles, the those arms, those suspension arms, ball joints, tie rod ends, are being expected to travel beyond their normal and correct set range of travel. And the position and amount of camber change that occurs from suspension moves uh, during the jounce and, and rebound. So what it's saying is that if the ride height is, is wrong, your camber can be, can be cassette correctly, but if your ride height is wrong, then the change that occurs when you move, your, when you drive the vehicle is going to be incorrect. And that's going to cause your tires to wear uh, more and your directional stability and drivability of the vehicle will be influenced by that. So if the vehicles, if the springs are weak and the suspension is sagged, two or more inches below, and I'm, that should be centimeters, not inches, below the specified ride height, and the arms are forced to travel above their normal plane and beyond their normal range of travel, which is totally undesirable. An unequal camber, it can lead to unequal camber and tow and can cause the vehicle to lead to one side or the other. Ride height is important. Differences in ride height also upset the steering geometry. I mentioned that earlier. Raising and lowering of the vehicle changes the ax angle of the steering axis and it can affect the steering and the ability, the uh, way that the steering res responds in returning to, to zero point. And there's a safety angle too, and I mentioned about, uh, about the brake aspect, but also if you raise the, if the front of the vehicle is too, too high or the rear has been overloaded, as often happens with buckies then the headlights are, are going to cause a, a driving obstacle to, to oncoming traffic. So where to measure ride height? Measuring of ride height is taken uh, in two different locations. One can be between the center hub of the, uh, of the vehicle, center of the hub of the vehicle to the fender arm uh, or, or fender top, as this, this guy is doing on this picture. The other one is to go from the ground in the lower picture, go from the ground to the fender arch, um, or you can go underneath the vehicle on the right-hand side uh, picture uh, schematics. You can go between the ground and the center line of the hub underneath the vehicle and or between the ground and the, um, and the, the chassis rails. Now, these are, are measurements that are given by different manufacturers in different uh, contexts. And when looking at specifications of ride height, it's important to understand 
which measurement they have given or are requiring um, because that will determine whether you get the measurement and, and the right height setting correct for the vehicle. Um, so it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's pretty, pretty significant to know exactly what you're looking at and, and where. So symptoms of incorrect ride height, your caster readings could be out of spec, your camber readings could also be out of spec, um, and, uh, and, and it obviously affects how the vehicle moves up and down at the time, especially if the springs are, are more compressed due to being sagging or broken. Symptoms of incorrect ride height is increased, increased tire wear, um, suspension bottoming out because the springs are are weakened, have weakened through use. Springs effectively are a service item. They, they have a lifespan. They are continuously going up and down. They are metal. They will fatigue over time. So a, a spring is not something that is for life on a vehicle, especially when the vehicle is being driven hard or it's carrying heavy loads, um, as we may do when, uh, when, when working with buckies and so on. And of course, body sway and nose diving when braking. So any any untoward vehicle stability is obviously a, a factor when it comes to to ride height uh, measurement and and correction. Correcting ride height problems, um, effectively, the correct the the most important principle is to replace the springs if the ride height is uh, is not correct, but. You can shim them, but it will raise to harshness in ride, ride harshness uh, in the vehicle, and um, it um, it will it will also um, give you an un, a different feel in the steering of the vehicle, which is not what you want either. So it's it it can re increase the the option or the potential for the spring bottoming out as well so it's it's the better way is to re, to restore good attitude to the vehicle is to fit new springs to it and obviously if the vehicle is carrying low high heavy loads it's possible to increase the suspension uh, levels raise put in heavier duty springs front and rear um, you can put in longer spring shackles but it's preferable to put in a uh, an extra leaf if it's a leaf spring or to put in a heavier duty torsion bar in the, if it's a torsion bar suspension. In some instances, we see vehicles with an air suspension where when they are, are towing a, a heavy caravan or something like that, or loading heavy loads, they, they are able to uh, pump up the airbags on the rear suspension to give a little bit of extra ride height uh, on the rear of the vehicle from that perspective. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all of this, but the reality is, is that what this, this is talking about is that replace your springs um, when you've got a ride height problem um, because it, it's, it really is the best process, the best route to go, and it's the safest and the cheapest route in, in the long run. So wheel alignment, the correct process. Uh, I've got a double slide there. Correct slide, correct process. Um, obviously, balance and rotate. The balance, rotate, and do alignment every eight thousand kilometers, as this can save up to twenty five percent of tire life. What is a proper procedure for for alignment checking? Firstly, tire pressures must be checked and set. The suspension component, visual checks, and spanner checks. And these are the processes that a good wheel alignment technician should be undertaking on your vehicle when you do it or when you have it done. He must measure the ride height and correct the ride height if he can, um, where there are adjustments to be made. And if need be, obviously replacement components must be fitted. He needs to do a caster swing and adjust the caster correctly so that the, uh, the wheels are, are in, at the right angle to the, to the vehicle. Then do the toe measurement and correction, and finally do the camber check and adjustment. And then once he's done all that, he needs to make sure that the thrust angle is checked, and if need be, adjust the, the thrust angle and start the process over again. 
And then the steering angle correction with modern vehicles, there are electronic steering angle check uh, controls um, where the steering angle sensor is built into the steering rack and it needs to be reset with a diagnostics machine, not just a case of pulling the steering wheel off and moving it slightly and rebolting it on. Um, these things get done with the steering angle, uh, with the steering angle sensor corrector. Um, and if not done, the steering angle will continue to be offset and you, will, you won't be a happy driver. And then of course, finally, the parking area test, turning left or right to check correction and straightening of the, of the steering wheel after the alignment to make sure that it returns to a zero position. And, and then a road test to see that the vehicle is tracking um, at, at normal driving speed in a straight line up and down the road. So in a nutshell, that brings to, to the uh, to conclusion the, this particular session on wheel alignment. And um, there's lots to talk about with additional sessions in the series. We will probably talk about batteries on the next session in a month from now. Um, we'll go on to wiper blades, uh, which obviously at this stage is the Western Cape region's uh, bugbear with rain and ours in the Gauteng inland areas uh, later in the year. And again, uh, any other sections that you'd like us to talk about, please let us know so that we can, uh, we can include them. And together we can keep you from steering your cash down the drain and help, to keep, help you align your profits. Thank you very much for the session. I appreciate the time and opportunity to address you. And for now, safe traveling and stay safe. <laughs>